Now this design was sent in by one of our newest members and that's Anne who lives in Wales. And Anne chose to do Horseshoe Lake in the Snowdon Snowdonia Range. And this is a photograph of the scene that she's digitised. And the overall effect when you look at it is Prussian blue. It's just layer upon layer upon layer of Prussian blue at various strengths. But of course we're not painting, we've got to do it in threads. That's where loose density fills come in fantastically. We know what our deepest colour is and we've got two in this design. A blue and a dark bluish grey. Those are our deepest colours. It's echoed there, it's echoed here, it's echoed here, here, here. All the tips of these are all blue. And then we get that vague blueness underneath. And then we get this coating of white mist which bleaches out any other information. And the same here really, you can't really see what's underneath there. And then the other colour that we see is this, I'm not quite certain what, what to call it. It's not unlike this. Oh, that's a green grey. Now this is the trouble with computer colour guns. That's green gold. Now, it's not green gold. It's like copper waste. And when you think that this was mined for copper, whole of the Snowdonia range, this could be slag. I mean, the colour of this lake is the colour of that shadow. And I know that because I went and picked the colours with my pickup, which gives me the RGB values. And then here we have this light buff and overlays of a coppery tan. And down here, it's not part of this, this comes down as far as here and is way up in the air. This is right down at the edge of the lake. That's clay colour. Which really is what that is, but it's got a hint of blue in it, this. This is all bluey. So you could say your colour palette was shades of greys, a little bit of yellow ochre, because that's such a handy colour. Warm greys and blues. Anne asked about push-pull. It's a vexing subject, Anne. And you've got three possible causes. One, your hoop doesn't grip well enough on the left-hand side. It is a fault with, you know, well, all domestic embroidery machines. The long straight edges lose grip. Industrial machines don't have straight edges. Unless it's a border frame. And then they have dirty great big long clamps that fit over the border frames. But they are rounded corners and mildly rounded long ends. They've got a bow in them and that helps increase the grip on the fabric. You've got Florentine effect. That creates pull. You've also got enormously long stitches in a few places. One of these has got a six millimeter long stitch. 4.2 is the longest stitch really that you should go for when you're digitizing because even that has a tremendous amount of pull on it and if you have a 6 mil stitch not like a basting stitch the machine slackens off the top tension you know each one of these you should be able to lift up off the cloth because it's so baggy and that's how much it lifts the tension. But of course it doesn't lift the tension for a 6 mil stitch for the embroidery design. So every time that you've made a 6 mil stitch, you're losing up to 2 tenths of a millimetre. Each end, that's nearly half a millimetre. And I haven't counted how many stitches there are. But there you go. 
there's your, there's your pulling in and your gapping. This sets up a tremendous amount of pull. If you don't use your magnets when you've got your stabiliser and your fabric in the hoop then it will pull. In fact I don't think they gave us enough magnets. Now you say you like the sky and the lake. I'm with you on the sky. I think the sky is lovely. But you have got several different densities and that's another thing which can cause pull. You've got a millimetre density on the white. I have to find it. First of all I have to ungroup everything. Edit, ungroup. Right, so let's go and look at the actual design. You've got a millimetre as a density in this area. So I'll just knock that out of simulated stitch. Didn't ungroup at all. Edit, ungroup. That's better. Right, object details. That's a millimetre density. And you've got travel on edge. Try not to use travel on edge. It gives very, very hard edges and it kills feathering. The only trouble is it does introduce whip stitches. But then at this end, and I think it's fantastic that you used the purple, you see this hard ridging. That's caused by, let me just get rid of this, you've got underlay on, on that one. That was the other thing, I found underlay on a few things. Stitch pattern one, uh, it gives you an angled ridge effect. If you watch for stitch pattern two, it's not as noticeable. Needle penetrations are staggered better. That's why I use it the whole time. But you've got a 1.6 density. I'm going to take that off because you've got a huge feathering, uh, feathering margin, 18.28 millimeters. I'm not going to say that's wrong because it isn't. It's just unusual. Then we go to your next layer. So that's two layers with the purple. One at a millimeter, one at 1.6. Then we come to this one. Object details. 1.6 again. So now, just at this end, we have got um, what's half a 16.8. And we don't want the travel on edge because we want your feathering. OK. Now we come down to this one. So you've got one, two, three, four layers of fill. And this one is a millimetre again. I travel on edge on it. Don't want you. OK. So here we've got 0.5. Because they're both one mil. Here we've got 0.8 on top of 0.5. Had it only been one layer, you would have got away with it, as it's two layers, not really. You're setting up pull. Now what I didn't check was your stitch length. A stitch length 4.2, that's okay. You get the light bouncing off of that. That's another reason why you can get a pull. Now I know I did say in my video that um, cross hatching was okay when you wanted a colour to bleed through. I didn't mean in big areas. Blending colour works best when your angles follow one another. Now and again it's okay to do a cross hatch. Maybe on the base you've got a layer of white like you have here and you want it to shine through your next few layers. 
So you do your next few layers with a matching to one another angle and allow the, the other angle of the white for the white to come through and shine. But I wouldn't advise using it the whole time. Florentine, people are very fond of Florentine. I like it, but it does set up push-pull. I think it's in the lake where you've got very long stitch length. Not that one. And you've used number three as a pattern. I wouldn't actually have gone for number three, but then that's me. You all have to arrive at your own particular choices. This one, two millimeter speech spacing. That's quite wide, very gappy. I've forgotten what the previous one was. That's two millimeters. That's 140. So that's 340. 640 divided by three because you've only used three layers. You've got a an overall stitch density of two mils and a stitch length of six millimeters. Far too long. Every time that that top needle grabs the bobbin thread on a long stitch loses an enormous amount of spread gets yanked down into the fabric and shortened so you've got to watch out for things like that if you use a long stitch on can I pick up this one is that the one with I can't tell if that's where's the stitch angle Oh, it's dreadful when you can't see things. And I've got my new glasses. That's the Florentine. Yeah, it's got a Florentine on it. A stitch spacing of 120 and stitch length of 4. Right, if you're going to use Florentine, you've got to shorten your stitch length. Lessen the amount of pull that it creates. Now, I know it sounds silly to say that shorter stitches make less pull, but they do. But overall, as a very first attempt, I think you've made an extremely good job. I like your colour choices, although you do have 22 discrete colours. How do I know? I'm idle, so I let the programme tell me. Colours, 22. That's not colour changes. That's discrete colours. I don't actually know how many colour changes you've got. But you've got one sheet, you've got two sheets. Now if you've watched the review of Marie's you will see I used to use a colour grid. Now for 22 discrete colours 22 times 22 equals 484 possible colours because you're colour blending. Right, let's just close this. So I'm going to do a full set of videos now on how to use colour blending in a design. Um, and it's going to be a repetition because I did the fur and hair videos and what were the fur and hair videos? all about blending colours with loose density. Um, I did the Christmas Rose. Now you won't know this Anne because you weren't a member. But I did the Christmas Rose and that also was about blending colours using loose density. It had some undershading and it had some overshading. A picture like this needs the shading put in to give it form. Highlight, shade, highlight, shade, highlights, fingers of them, fingers of shade, and shade. The shade throws the highlight into relief. 
It's what gives design its form. You can do a design in nothing but black and white. Well, black on white, let's put it that way. Which makes it a wee bit dull. But here you've got a light grey, a coppery colour, a dark grey. Um, that's the coppery colour again coming down here. This water and this shadow are the same colour as is that and these and this. These are looser density and if you're doing mountains in the background don't do three layers just do the mountain shape where the highlights are and then do the other side of it in a different colour. Use your fill angles. Fill angles give direction. This ridge is sweeping up. Make your fill angles sweep up. This one is coming up in that direction. Make your fill angles do it. There's a ledge here. Use your fill angles to give the appearance of the ledge. It's all about using the shadows, the highlights and your fill angles and the minimum of colour to the maximum of effect. So when I do the video set I'm going to ask everybody to do another design and I don't know what the subject will be yet but I will find one and it will need undershading and overshading. Right, I'm going to move on now, Anne, and I'm chuffed monkeys that you did this. I agree with you, your sky is excellent. You've got the changes in colour nicely. So, and I like your colour choices for the blending. But I hope when I do the next set of videos, you'll see what I mean when I say we use the minimum of colours to create the maximum. And yes, I th take it this is where you were talking about, along the ridge, where you said it was more of a petrol blue and there wasn't enough grey in it. I think you're right. But then again, if you look around Cornwall and you look around Wales, what's the predominant colour around copper mines? Really lovely greeny blue colour. Okay, I've got to move on.